So if you have been on architecture social media at all in the recent years, you might have noticed that rendered physical models are becoming increasingly popular. And, and there's a huge controversy about whether that is a good thing or a sacrilege to a profession. But with all that being said, there's actually a crucial disadvantage to rendering a physical model. And that is the fact that at the end of your term, you can't set it on fire and see it burn. That is until now. Today in this tutorial, we will bring your rendered model into the physical world and then set it on fire afterwards. Hope you guys are excited for this. So if you guys are interested in how to create this using Rhino V-Ray and Photoshop, make sure to stick around and enjoy the tutorial. Okay, so here is our Rhino project that we're going to be rendering. So let's first off start by importing the background for our viewport. In order to do so, we're going to go over to our properties tab and scroll all the way down where it says wallpaper. From here, we'll choose file. Okay, once the file has been imported, let's temporarily disable our model so we can see the background. All right, so what we're going to do here first is going to be perspective matching. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, I'm going to try my best to explain this as best as possible, but a part of it has to kind of come down to your intuition. So the best way I like to start is by finding out where the parallel lines are. So let's first off start by drawing a really long line. So and make a copy of it. So now we have two lines running parallel to each other. We can use these two lines to kind of match where these dominant line of a desk is running. So for example, let's... And as you can see, our lines are more parallel than the one in the image. So that means that our focal length is not wide enough. So let's go ahead and switch our camera length to let's say about 30. And by playing around with the camera angle and perspective, you should be able to get it fairly close in aligning the parallel lines. Okay, so as you can see, these two parallel lines are now aligned with the desk. And the second thing we have to do is make sure the 90 degree angle also matches up. So when we look closely, as you can see, our plane of reference is also right angle. It's like a square but the table is also square, but for some reason, these are not aligning. And that means there's a bit of a camera angle issue. So from what I'm seeing, so when a camera angle is wider, the exaggeration becomes more extreme. And as you can see in the photo, this right angle looks sharper than it is in my reference plane. So that means my camera angle or my lens length is not wide enough. So again, I'm gonna be reducing this down to let's say about 20 and let's try aligning this again so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to align the parallel lines and we're getting a little bit closer now but i think we're still too wide or we're not wide enough so let's go ahead into something like 19 degrees And we are fairly close. So I think at this point, I would say this is pretty good. Um, unless someone's like looking really close, they probably won't notice the difference. Once we have gotten our perspective and camera setup to somewhere kind of close to where we want it to be, let's go ahead and save this view so we don't have to do this process again. So for that, I will open up named view. And here, I'll just save it as perspective. All right, we'll come back to this later. And before we move our camera away for modeling purpose, let's make sure we have a rectangle too so that we can reference this again while we are modeling. So I'll start by creating a plane. And let's just try to kind of visualize where the table is. That's pretty good. So once we have a table plane aligned, What's really nice about this is that whatever we place here from now on is going to match perspective. So for example, if I go ahead and create a box here, as you can see, it seems as if the box is on the table. 
and when we move it around, it still looks as if it's in the room, like so. So this is a benefit of spending a bit more time in the beginning to match your perspective. And now you're free to, you know, make any funny angles. And you can kind of safely assume that everything will fit into the scene nicely. Alright, so let's go back to our modeling view and remove the background. Now we can use this plane as a reference to our table. Let's bring back our model and place it on there. I'm going to go ahead and scale it down just a little bit. Seems like a good size and place it right in the middle of our table. Okay, so from here you can go ahead and you know play around with the settings. You can add some more people and furnitures. I'm going to go ahead and add some people and trees on here. Okay, so I've just imported our 3D people and tree models. If you're interested in downloading them, you can find them in the link in the description. So that being said, let's go ahead and start populating our model with these people. So I'm going to go ahead and start moving them over to here. And I'll actually isolate them right here, like so. And then place them here and make some extra copies of them. So I'll go ahead and make array. Let's say 3 in X and... Let's, let's say one for now. So we have a row of people going. Have the same thing going on on the other side. And let's go ahead and replicate them this way. So if you hold on Alt as you make Gumroad transformation, it'll create copies of your model. All right. So once we have people all around, I'm going to go ahead and use our plugin, Random Move. So if you also want to get this command, you can also download it from our um, website. This one is free to download, so feel free to get it as much as you want. And then let's move him around just a little bit so that nobody falls off the board. Okay, great. It's a quick way to add some life into your model. And I'll do the same thing to the trees. Okay, well, I'll leave it at there for now. I mean, as per the usual, you can spend as much or little time as you want on your model. For now, for today's demonstration purpose, I'll stop here. So now here's a fun part. We have to find a way to render this and Photoshop them into our image. So let's bring back the background image and let me just uh, hide this for a second. Okay, so I like the placement of it right now because it allow us to kind of like cover up this little jar right here so that means I don't have to photoshop that out and we could even you know bring this a little closer if you would like but that's totally up to you uh, for now I'll just bring it closer just a little bit and yeah I think the model itself is ready and there are a couple more things we need to do and one of them is creating the light so when you're creating the light for your own image kind of try to analyze where the lights are coming from so in this scene for example the primary source of light is from the right side, from this giant window that has been covered up by a blind. So let's see if we can find a light type that can replicate this form. And that will be using a rectangular light that covers up the whole side. Okay. So let's go ahead and select our light. bring it over and rotate it okay and since our camera has already been perspective matched our light will actually fall right into exactly where we need it as well or this could be a sign where it tells us that our perspective has not been matched quite perfectly. Yep. Um, well, I think it's getting fairly close, although this diverging line is, is, a, is a little concerning. So when you're working on your own project, make sure to spend a bit extra time so we can um, avoid these kind of mistakes. 
But for now, I think this is pretty good start. Um, and let's take a look at how it looks for now. The test render. So one thing I like to do when I'm first setting up a project is actually by using a interactive lighting mode. Oh, whoops. Okay, so let's turn on interactive so that we can see our changes in real time and start this up. Now we can quickly adjust our camera exposure so that we can get the right amount of exposure. So it looks a little too bright, so I'll lower that. Okay, cool. That looks pretty good. So once this is ready, I'm going to go ahead and increase our resolution and change our render settings. So I'll remove interactive, remove progressive, and change our render output to something a little bit more high res. Let's say 1920 by 1080. Or better yet, let's make it a portrait orientation so that we can actually match our photograph. So here's how our test render looks like. As you can see, the model itself looks really good. Maybe there's something funny happening with the texture, which I'll go ahead and fix. But another concerning thing is that our window is a little too dominant. Obviously, if we just take this and put it, bring it into Photoshop, we're gonna have to individually crop out the buildings, and that's a lot of work. And another thing is that our plane is being rendered as well. And that means we have to manually Photoshop this in as well. And it'll be really tricky in places like here where the tree is overlapping with the background plane. So let's find a way to get around this. And there's a nifty trick for that. So let's go ahead and address these problems. For the texture issues, we'll go ahead and go find our tree trunk texture and make them all white. Okay, that should fix our texture issue. And the second thing, the light. So for the light settings, we can go ahead and open this in our V-Ray Asset Editor. And over here. And here, if we go down to our options, we can make our light invisible. So there we go. And you can kind of see in the preview, right? So if this is a plane of light, the plane itself disappears, but the light that's coming out of it is still there. Okay, so that has been resolved. And for our plane, so here's the life hack that you can use for your future projects. We'll go ahead and create a new material. We can leave it the default setting and way it is. But the true trick comes from the wrapper material. So open up wrapper and add our generic material as the base. Once that's been done, try to replicate these settings. Turn on the matte setting, turn on shadow, and change our alpha contribution to negative one. And of course, make sure to apply this wrapper material to our base. So the base would be our tabletop. So once that's been done, our setup is complete. We can go ahead and hit render and see what happens. Okay, so as you can see, our light is gone, our texture looks good, and our tabletop has disappeared. So what's, what's going on, right? At this point, we can quickly go over to our RGB color and channel settings and head over to alpha. And here you can see where our shadow is. So this channel indicates which part of our uh, image will be transparent and which part will be opaque. As you can see, our shadow will be semi-translucent area that is actually black. So that means you can easily export this into a PNG file and place it into any image with ease. And there will be virtually no error in cropping things. And not only does this save time, but also makes your rendering more accurate. So let's go ahead and increase our quality and also add a denoiser so that we can have a better quality render.
we will scroll all the way up here and enable denoiser and leave it as V-Ray. Okay, rendering has started and I'll see you guys on the other side. Okay, rendering has finished. Let's go ahead and save our image as a PNG file to a project location. Okay, and here's the moment that we have all been waiting for. Let's import both our background image as well as our render output. So I've opened up our render output and placed the base image into the background. I'll go ahead and crop our view. And we're already almost quite close. As you can see, our perspective is matching quite well, and the shadow has translated into our scene pretty nicely. Perhaps the only thing that we're missing right now is color correction. I noticed that the photograph has a bit of a warmer tone that we missed because, I mean, of course, our background preview was uncolored. Let's go ahead and create a quick curves adjustment clipped onto our render output. So I'll create a curves adjustment layer and adjust our curves so that we include a little bit more, improve, improve the base, and then let's tone down on the light side, like so. And then let's head over to red and increase red just a little bit. And we'll also go ahead and increase the green to create this yellowish tone. And for some reason, the shadow looks a little too harsh to me right now. So maybe I'll go ahead and do some manual masking. So with our layer being selected, I'll add a mask and take a soft brush and gently brush out some of our shadow. So I suspect that reason um, it looks a little too harsh is because in the actual photograph, the lights are bouncing within the room. So some of the light source, uh, so some of the light that enters through the window will be bouncing off of the wall on the other side and coming back to our scene. But for in our setting, we've only created one rectangular light on the right. So there's virtually no light coming in from the left side. So I suspect that that's what's making this look a little bit awkward. Of course, it's always the best if you can replicate your base scene as much as possible. But when that is not an option, you can do quick fixes like this. And there you have it. Here's your physical model rendering into your photograph. All right, hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. If you found anything useful from this tutorial, make sure to give us a like. And if you want to see more life hacks like this one, make sure to give us a subscribe so you'll see more videos on your feed. And last but not least, also make sure to check out our newsletter, blog, and Instagram, where we regularly post bite-sized tutorials like this one to upgrade your architectural career. So that being said, it's been Ben, and I'll see you guys in the next one.